It's time to pull those belts tight, race fans. The Front Stretch is coming at you. Presented by Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs. Now, here's Dan Taylor and Dirk Houston. Well, good morning, race fans, and welcome to the Front Stretch. Presented by Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs. Online at joeskarting.com. That is karting with a K. Get to Joe's today. Fast-paced, white-knuckle racing. Now with eco-friendly Honda engines, so uh, you're burning less uh, emissions when you're in there at Joe's Karting turning laps. And uh, one thing that, it's something that doesn't get talked about enough and something that I, I applaud them about. When I first went down and talked to them about advertising and what makes them different than everybody else, one of the things they talked about was their air circulation, which kind of seems to make sense. Indoor karting facility, you're burning fuel, there's emissions in there. A lot of places, I think the government only rely, and I, I'm just top quoting off the top of my head, so don't take this for fact, but I, I believe they, that most places only have to turn the air over two or three times an hour. I think Joe's Karting does it eight times an hour. So you're not going to get that nauseous... Um, um, that's half the fun. Carbon, <laughs> carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, what article did I read earlier this week that there was a, um, a NASCAR driver that uh, suffered from mass carbon monoxide poisoning? I don't know. It could have been any of them with as hot as it was in Indy. Oh, it was ridiculous. But apparently, I, I think this is back when uh, you used to be involved in the truck series, obviously two different series, but the way that they had the exhausts ran on those cars and the aero packages made the exhaust come back inside the car and gave this driver carbon monoxide poisoning, and they had no idea what it was back then. I'm going to find it real quick for you guys, and then... Uh, well, they've known what carbon monoxide poisoning was for quite some time, but... Rick Mast. Rick Mast. Yeah, there's a really good article in Auto Week uh, talks about where where is Rick Mast, his career, his rise to fame, uh, and his constantly being plagued with nausea, headaches, dizziness, uh, and fatigue, and uh, then they ended up figuring out that it was carbon monoxide poisoning. So you're right. They, they've known what carbon monoxide poisoning was for a while, but that's something you're not going to get at Joe's Karting is what I'm getting at. Uh, a great facility. If you haven't checked it out yet, get to Joe's today in uh, in Council Bluffs, online at joeskarting.com, karting with a K. Big show lined up for you today. We're going to talk Indy, uh, our thoughts on Indianapolis, uh, talk about the rules package. Dirk, I want to get your uh Ending analysis on the rules package, how it laid out. Plus, there's been a lot of conversation with teams all this week about how they felt about it. Uh, a lot of teams, uh, there's a couple of teams that are talking about shuffling manufacturers. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We'll talk some uh, NASCAR news and notes, get you an update on Buddy Baker. Uh, turn number two, we were originally going to talk with Shaylee Bade, but uh, she got stuck at work, so she's not able to join us today. I apologize to the Bade fans that no tuned BLTs. in to listen to her. No No bacon today, and we apologize. Uh, Smokey's not going to make it in today either. So we've rescheduled her for next week. Uh, but in turn number three, we are going to talk with Ed Carpenter. Now, we talked to him a while ago. It was before the Indi- the Iowa race, actually. Uh, what, July uh, 19th was that race. And we talked to him uh, that week of that race. And we got a big retrospective of his career, talk about a lot of that stuff, like we typically do. Uh, that's going to be in turn number three. And you can catch their race today on CNBC. They're going to be at Mid-Ohio. So check that out uh, on CNBC. Then uh, in turn number four, Mr. Fantasy Chad Robb is going to join us. We're going to talk tips for the last six races. Uh, it's getting down to crunch time, and that uh, that season-long pickups contest is really starting to heat up. I was talking with Kevin Beadle, who's one of the uh, contestants on there, and he said uh, I think he's at three wins on the season. He's sitting 12th in the points, and I, I said, man, you're going to have to get probably one or two more wins under your belt before you're going to feel comfortable. Uh, so Chad's going to get in the studio and talk to us about who to pick for the next six races, and then we'll get you an update on the Midwest Fall Brawl Contest presented by I-80 Speedway. All right, uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Uh, boy, I've, I've not been a big fan of this race. I just don't think stock cars are good at Indianapolis. And I applaud NASCAR for the attempt at working on the aero package. Do you think it worked, Dirk? Um, no, because the car that was out front still seemed to have a pretty good size advantage. Mm-hmm. If the car behind them was markably faster, they could uh, get up and tuck under their left rear and take some air off them and loosen them up a little bit and then get by them and then walk away from them just like Kyle Busch did at the end. I mean, when he passed, he went. Yeah, and that was what, I mean, it was th- that big conversation those last couple of restarts was all about getting a push from the guy behind him and getting him out in front. And oddly enough, he didn't go with his teammate. He went with his old teammate, 
who ended up giving him the push and got out there. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, it, uh, um, I don't think Denny had quite the car. I don't think so either. That's why I think he avoided him. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, they. I mean, they do that at just about every track on restarts, so that's nothing unusual. But it was quite a pronounced difference there for a lot of these guys on the inside lane. Like, that 15, to la- 15 laps to go restart when Carl Edwards was in second place. Next thing you know, he comes around in 15th. Yeah, well, he, he'd gotten loose on the outside and slid up the track But he was on the inside. Hair. Was he in the— And he oh, got okay. bumped. Oh, okay, you must be talking about a different one then. No, it's the same one. Oh, okay. He got bumped and got shuffled out through turn one mm-hmm. and ended up on the outside, and then they just freight trained him. Yeah, it, you know, Indy is— it, I just I cringe at this race because, well, the whole broadcast is all about how legendary this track is. Well, the track's not legendary because of NASCAR. It's legendary because of IndyCar, and, and it is an important track, and it is a huge influence on auto racing. But it's it's two people. It's trying to put a square uh, a peg in a round hole. You know, it's. They're two different styles of tracks, and, and you got to have banking for NASCAR as far as I'm concerned. Well, but then you're going to throw out New Hampshire, and you're going to throw out Martinsville. I mean, those tracks don't have any banking. Yeah, yeah, you got me there. That's absolutely right. You know. I, I'm just not a big fan of Indy. I don't know. I mean, it just, I don't, it's not an exciting race to me. Well, to me, it's pretty boring, but to me, the Indianapolis 500 is boring, unless yeah. you get a green-white checkered. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, I will give credit. I did stay pretty entertained. I, I, I think I might have a new man crush. Steve Letarte and that broadcast team is, I, I, I posted about it, I think, on Saturday on, on my Facebook page. They're, those guys are making the Fox broadcast team look like clowns. Yeah, I mean, Steve and uh, Jeff Burton and uh, Rick Allen are doing real well together. I mean, they're, they're, seeing what, they're thinking what each other is thinking. That, the Xfinity race was about as entertaining as the cup race, but those guys never stopped talking about the different strategies. And they did it again last week at New Hampshire. I didn't even notice it until I was really kind of paying attention to it this week at Indy. That, that, or last week at Indy, you know, and the week before New Hampshire is what I mean. But they they talk about strategy when there's not a, a, a battle for the lead or battles going on. Then they start talking about strategy, and and that's I guess that's really what Steve Latart was great at was understanding the landscape of how the race needs to lay out for his driver well him and chad canals and a bunch of these guys like he said he goes you play the race backwards yeah you know you get to a certain point and you go backwards you find out where your last fuel window is and that's why some of those guys were making early stops and then with all the cautions at the end it all got thrown out the window and i think fans are starting maybe this is just a coincidence but uh nascar had its highest rated telecast for indianapolis of the season well, it's because it was so darn hot out, everybody stayed in the air conditioning and turned the tube on. <laughs> you might be right. You might be absolutely right. But uh, I'm going to give a little credit to the broadcast team. Those guys did a great job. There's just so much information coming at you with that broadcast team. They, they're, they're, their information is clean and concise. It's delivered well. And, and quite frankly, I was talking with a friend of mine, uh, that uh, one of the few friends that I have on the Cub circuit, that uh, – he said it, it's time for Fox to really look at, at their broadcast lineup. I was a huge fan of Larry McReynolds until Steve Letart got on the broadcast. And then I realized Larry's good, and Larry, Larry is a great personality. He's a very smart man, but he hasn't been in the sport for how long? 10, 15 years? Right. I mean, that's two generations of cars, at least. It's it's just been too long for that broadcast team. They're old and stale, and you got to freshen it up. you got to get somebody new in there that knows how the newer cars are running and knows how the new driver's mentality are. But that broadcast is absolutely amazing. Give it a shot. I, I don't think you're, you're going to regret it if you give it a chance. Uh, your results from Indianapolis. Top 10 finishers. Brad Keselowski was 10th. Kyle Larson, 9th. Kurt Busch, 8th. Matt Kenseth, 7th. Clint Boyer, 6th. Good job for Clint coming back after an early race spin. Uh, didn't have much damage to his car. Uh, on the other side of it, Jeff Gordon, who got involved in it, finished 42nd. So uh, pretty heartbreaking final race for Jeff Gordon at uh, Indianapolis uh, for the uh, for the Brickyard 400 or the uh, excuse me, Crown Royal presents the Kyle... Uh, the Jeff Kyle 400 at the Brickyard. Excuse me, that was one of those where they... 
they honored a military member. But Gordon's uh, fiasco was no fault of his own. No, it was just one of those things, and that's heartbreaking. He seems to have had a lot of those this year, just one of those things. And you hate to see that happen any year, especially on his final year you know but uh fifth place Denny Hamlin uh, Martin Trucks Jr. fourth place Kevin Harvick third Joey Logano second and Kyle Busch was uh your winner four wins in five races I honestly remember a couple of weeks ago when we filled out that little sheet of where we thought Kyle was going to win now I haven't picked the races correctly but I thought I was really going out of limb with winning four races by the end of the chase there's still six races to go and he's already at that four win mark you know, this is something we haven't seen since Tony Stewart in 2011, and even this eclipses that because Tony didn't even go on the streak. He would win a race, finish bad one race, okay, another race, win a race. Well, Tony's you know. deal was he did his five wins in the streak in right. the chase. Right. Kyle's is a oh. little bit more consistent so far. I mean, we still have several races to go, but but man alive, it, it, it jumps him to the top of the seedings. I mean, right now, if the chase were to start, obviously he, you know, He's let's say he gets into the chase. He goes from being probably 28th or 29th when Darlington ends to all of a sudden he is probably going to be the points leader when it gets. Well, he's going to be tied with Jimmy Johnson with four wins. Uh, so he'll have uh, what 12 bonus points when they reset for round number one at uh, Chicagoland, New Hampshire, and Dover. But yeah, it's this is just remarkable that the way he's been able to come back and. And kudos to Adam Stevens. They brought him up from the Xfinity Series, which obviously Kyle was winning a lot in the Xfinity Series the last couple of years with Adam Stevens as his crew chief, and it's all working out for him. This mm-hmm. is this is just amazing. All right. Uh, let's see. What else we got to talk about here? Um, a lot of conversation going on in the, uh, in the motorsports world about reorganization of a couple of teams, and I'm kind of interested in this. In turn number three, we're going to dive more into some more of these stats and why I think this is crazy, but Michael Waltrip Racing talking about making the move to Chevy, and Furniture Row Racing is talking about making the move over to Toyota. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get into this a little bit more about those two teams making that move, but that's just kind of a little bit of a news and notes. Um, well, I'm, I'm surprised if Toyota does pick up Furniture Row that they would pick up a single car team. So unless Furniture Row's got the thought of expanding. They have. They've talked about adding a second team in 2016 or 2017 if things aren't moving uh, as quickly as they want them to. Because I, I think that's one of Toyota's requisites. But that wouldn't be bad for uh, for, for Martin Truex because he just came from Toyota, Michael, right. Michael Waltrip Racing. So, he, you know, a little bit of familiarity there. Uh, Jimmy Johnson working on a contract extension in the 48 car with Hendrick Motorsports. He is, uh, they're working on signing Chad Knauss. Boy, I don't think it's a possibility, but boy, what if Chad Knauss didn't come back to that 48 team next year? Where is he going to go? I, that's what, I don't know why you would break that up. I mean, I'm, I'm sure this is just one of those things that they're just working on finalizing the details and we just don't have the announcement yet. They're working on re-signing Lowe's and a couple more sponsors to make sure they've got the sponsorship laid in before they sign the driver again. But before they put the right amount of zeros behind don't, that, don't you, don't give up a good thing, man. Don't I, I, you see so many of these other sports like LeBron James that thinks, well, I'm the best, so I'm going to go where the money is and 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 I'll win championships regardless. And that hasn't been the case for him. He's won a couple of championships. He's a talented player, but we see this all the time in other sports. Let's not see this in our sport. <laughs> Let's not go where the zeros are. Let's go where the rings are. And they've got, uh, what, six of them now looking for seven and eight. So interesting stuff. Also, contract extension t- conversation. Danica Patrick uh, looking to – it's looking possible that she's going to re-sign with Stuart Haas Racing. Now, I was going fan base here. I was going with my fanatical fan mind here a little bit and starting to explore – Different possibilities for what Stuart Haas well, Racing could look like in 2016. You've got man crushes and you've got mm-hmm. a woman crush. I do. Well, you know, Danica's. <laughs> I like Danica and I defend her because I think she gets a bad rap. But the truth is, the results aren't there. But you know what? <laughs> the results aren't there for the team owner either. I mean, she is actually beating Tony in the championship standings right now with how bad that or with how bad that 14 team is. This is just me. Going, cr- I, I want to stress that because I don't think there's any legitimacy to this at all. Nobody else is going to agree with you is what right, you're saying. Right, I think Tony Stewart's retiring at the end of the year. Even though the, he was asked about it a couple of weeks ago and he said, I'm focused on getting the 14 back. I think he's retiring at the end of the year. And I, 
I don't think Tony Stewart would ever announce that he's going to be retiring like Jeff Gordon did because Tony hates the limelight. Jeff deals with it well. Tony hates it. He he doesn't like the limelight. He I think he understand he likes the dollars that come with it and the sponsorships and all that fun stuff, but he hates the limelight. This is an aero package that he absolutely hates. And it's not like NASCAR is all of a sudden going to go, okay, you know what, let's go back to a, a lot of things that were a couple of years ago and, and our older drivers are running well with. I, I think Tony's retiring at the end of the year. I would love to see Kyle Larson signed to come over and race at Stuart Haas Racing. He's on a final year at Chip Ganassi Racing. And this this year is completely different than last year. So it, like it's a far-fetched idea, but that's something that, boy, put Kyle Larson with Kevin Harvick, Kurt Busch, and Tony Stewart as a team owner. And I think you've got a good combination of, of a kid that could learn a lot, especially with the sprint car background that Kyle and Tony share in common. So, you know, me being a little crazy. What do you think? You're... You're you're shaking your head over there. I don't know what'd you have for lunch. <laughs> <clears throat> I had my Wheaties this morning. <laughs> the brain's working. <laughs> yeah, you poured beer on them or what? All right, let's take. A... <laughs> Is there any other way? Yeah. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back in turn number two. We're going to talk with Ed Carpenter, driving the number twenty CFH Racing Verizon Wireless IndyCar Series vehicle. We'll talk to him about his career, his uh, chances of the year, his thoughts on uh, a lot of different things. This is the Front Stretch, presented by Joe's Carding on AM five ninety Omaha's ESPN Radio. One of the hardest things to find in the world is a trusted mechanic. Your car breaks down. You need someone that won't see you as an opportunity to pad their wallet. Jim at Tuffy Tire and Auto Service in Bellevue is that person. From brake and AC inspections to custom exhaust and new tires, Tuffy Tire and Auto Service in Bellevue is your new trusted source for getting your car back on the road. Find them on Facebook at Tuffy Tire and Auto Service Center of Bellevue and online at TuffyBellevue.com. Joe's Karting and Council of Bluffs has taken a page out of IMCA's rulebook and gone crate. These brand new low emission engines will still have you white knuckling it all through the Metro's fastest indoor facility. Joe's Karting is now friendly for all skill levels with their brand new Honda powered engines. It's time to get to Joe's today and find out what drivers like Jack Dover, Shaylee Bate, and Andrew Kosiski have known for years. Located in Council of Bluffs and online at joeskarting.com. That's karting with a K. This is Andrew from Kaziski Auto Parts. Kaziski Auto Parts is an insurance quality used parts supplier that can match your foreign or domestic car or truck needs. If you have a damaged or broke down car or truck, we guarantee a clean and quality part in next day fashion. Kaziski Auto Parts, your neighborhood premium recycled parts supplier. Call any Kaziski Auto Parts salesman today by dialing 402-731-4592 or visit us at 5040 I Street in Omaha. Kaziski Auto Parts, our quality used parts will match your car or truck's needs. We're hooked up in turn two and still showing the green flag on the front stretch. Heading into turn number two here on the front stretch, presented by Kaziski Auto Parts, online at Kaziski.com. And at 51st and I Street, quality used parts at an affordable price. Get your car or truck back on the road with your arms and legs still attached. Kaziski Auto Parts, Kaziski.com, or 51st and I Street in Omaha. We're talking with, uh, we're kind of breaking the norm a little bit here, Dirk. We're talking with an IndyCar driver. We talked to one a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we talked to uh, Marco Andretti about going to Iowa Speedway. And now we're talking to Ed Carpenter, driver of the number 20 CFH racing car uh, for, um, and I, I, I got this right, Carpenter Fisher Hartman Racing, right? Yeah, you got it. Hey, I broke that code. <laughs> I'm getting smart these days. All right. Well, Ed, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to kind of talk to us a little bit. You grew up outside of Indianapolis, and then you move in, moved to Indianapolis for most of your childhood. Is that what exposed you to open-wheel racing? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I grew up here in Indianapolis and, uh, you know, really had a passion for the Indianapolis 500 from a young age and, um, you know, grew up watching Thursday Night Thunder and, and the midget, USAC Midgets on ESPN and, and uh, you know, just fell in love with open wheel racing at a very young age. Did you go to some of those uh, uh, midget and sprint races out at uh, the old Raceway Park? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I was sneaking in the pits there way before I was old enough to, to actually get in legally. I think every racer's done that once or twice. Oh yeah. I would just hide I would just hide in buddies' trailers when they were taking the cars in and stay away from security all night. Was it always open wheel for you or were you ever thought of any kind of stock car or closed wheel racing? You know, I mean there there's been a couple of times I've thought about it, but you know, really for me 
you know, what, what motivated me to want to be a, a race car driver was the Indianapolis 500. So as I was coming up through the USAC ranks, midget sprint car, silver crown, um, a lot of guys I was racing with there were, were heading to NASCAR, Ryan Newman, Casey Kane, um, you know, Tony Stewart had, had paved the way and JJ Ailey still down there. Uh, but for me, you know, I, my heart was always at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and, and focusing on the 500. Well, that had to be quite the experience then to win the pole at the Indianapolis 500 because, th- I mean, that is kind of the your mecca, your home track. So that had to be a lot of pressure and a lot of excitement for you. Uh, it was. I mean, to, to be able to win the pole in, in 2013 and 14, uh, it was a lot of fun. You know, it's it's not as good as winning the race, and hopefully <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to, to check off that box one of these years. But it was it was still, you know, an honor to be able to, to add my name to that list of of Indianapolis 500 pole winners, and uh, you know, hopefully, I'll be able to to be on the board corner someday. Is there still when you're running Indy? Uh, we had when I was a senior in high school back in the late 70s. Tom Sneva came and uh, gave us one of those motivational talks about getting an education and staying in school type thing. But he was talking about all the radio interference at like the 500, and uh, you know, you'd hear the fire trucks as you're going down the back stretch and everything. Does, does a lot of that still go on, or have they got the technology around? To where you don't have that so much. Yeah, I think the technology. I mean, there's been times over my career where you where you'll pick up a, a stray signal or something, but I think the technology of the radios and and the antennas and things like that are, are so much better than they were, you know, 15, 20 years ago. That, that we really don't have to deal with a lot of that. Because he'd be talking, you know, he said you'd come out of turn two and you're flying down the back stretch at 220, and uh, he said you'd have a fire truck guy talking about the blonde in the second row, and <laughs> at, at 220 it was real tough to pick her out. <laughs> I bet. I can, I, can hear, I can hear the gas man saying that. <laughs> Did you ever think maybe you were just hearing voices and maybe it was time to go talk to somebody? <laughs> I, I can tell you that if that – if that was happening, it would be, it's easy to laugh about it, but it would be terribly obnoxious <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, and uh, frustrating. You, we, we've talked about your USAC career. So ha, ha, did you ever get a chance to go and race in January at the Chili Bowl or have you ever had the opportunity? Yeah, I, I've been to the Chili Bowl a couple times um, as, as a participant and a couple times as a spectator. Uh, it's a, a great event. I haven't been in a long time, but I need to change that and get back out there here soon. <laughs> it's kind of tough when you're in the, when you're when you're in the off season to to just kind of get back into the racing motion because you're like, man, come come February and March, I'm going to be in the racing motion 100. percent Yeah, my, my wife and I always talk about coming. We just haven't haven't put it together yet, but I'm sure I'll be back. You know, whether I'm watching or driving again someday. In uh, 2003, you made your move from the USAC Series to the Indy Lights Series, uh, racing for Sindon Racing, and then a year later, you went and raced for AJ Foyt Enterprises. And the number 14 car, that had to be an awesome experience for you to race such an for such an iconic driver and to race an iconic number. It, it really was. I mean, I grew up with AJ being one of my heroes. He's still one of my heroes. So, so to be able to go drive for him and his team, um, it, it was uh, something I'm very proud of, and we won the we won the Freedom 100 that year at Indianapolis, and you know that was that was a the biggest win of my career up to that point, and and really started to open some doors for me to to get into the IndyCar series. Did you ever get starstruck around him? Uh, at first, yeah. I mean, I knew yeah. him. I knew him as a family friend, you know, from a pretty oh. young age. So, you know, I think that was good because I I knew him already when I went to drive for him. Um, you know, then I just kind of learned a different side of him as a boss, uh, other than a friend, but you know, it, it was a lot of fun. We have a great relationship still always love being around him, listening to his stories and, uh, listen to what he has to say. Cause he still knows what he's talking about. Oh, and he can tell some stories. I've been, been around him at some of the NASCAR races and, you know, he had Larry trying to come up through the NASCAR ranks there and, uh, yeah, he can tell some stories. All right. Yes, he can. We're talking with Ed Carpenter, driver of the number 20 CFH racing automobile in the IndyCar Series, the Verizon IndyCar Series. You moved on to the Verizon IndyCar Series and started racing for Red Bull Racing, and then you went on to Vision Racing and Panther Racing. How did those rides help you become the eventual team owner you are today? Well, I I think everywhere you go and every every experience you get, whether it's, you know, driving for a team or just being a part of the team, you learn learn different things. You learn things that that you liked and thought were thought worked well and you also you know had a chance to observe things and say hey you know if I ever got a chance to run my own team I think I would do it a little differently or or change this or that so 
you know, over the over the course of your career, you you get the opportunity. You know, I, I had the opportunity to drive for a lot of really good teams, and you know, I think you try to to pick and choose what what you thought was positive of all of them, and then you know, when when I was fortunate enough to to be able to start a team, uh, you just kind of make it your own and and learn, you know, remember your experiences and and what worked well and go from there. Did you always feel like you were getting pulled into the direction of being a car owner or was it something that just kind of fell in your lap? I had always kind of had the idea that someday I would like to do it. I never really thought all that much that I would be a driver owner. Um, so in 2012, when we started the team, I, you know, I think it was, it, it was a, an opportunity that presented itself and it was too good of an opportunity to pass on, you know, knowing that, that I was interested in ownership at some point. Um, I felt like if I passed on the opportunity that was in front of me that, you know, you never know if you'll get that opportunity to, to break into the team ownership ranks again. So uh, just went with it and ran with it, and things have been going well. How often does uh, Ed the driver get into an argument with uh, Ed the owner? <laughs> uh, not that often. I mean, I, you know, I try to try to keep them separated, and uh, I'm, a pretty, I'm a pretty level-headed guy. You know, so when, when I'm driving, you know, I kind of – Lean on, lean on the group around me, my co-owners and and management, and you know that's that's one thing that we've we've always made clear and kept 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 clear is that you know when I'm driving, you know every, everyone needs to treat me that way, and not that not that I'm an owner because it can get a little a little messy at times if you if you try to act like an owner when you're driving, you know, it can be counterproductive. So try to keep the two separated the best I can. Yeah, because that, that relationship has to be, a little, like you said, difficult because the crew chief has to know, I got to tell him what to do as the driver and not worry about the repercussions when he gets out of the car as a team owner. Exactly. And, that you know, that those were conversations that we had very early on when we started the team, uh, just so people, you know, weren't worried about how to how they could handle me or you know talking freely you know for fe- for fear that they would be in jeopardy of being unemployed so um that's not my personality and also having you as the car owner and a driver you've got that right now experience but also your other co-owners uh, especially Sarah has racing experience so that's got to be handy too it kind of feels like you guys got a little bit of a leg up on the rest of the competition uh, we definitely have a lot of a lot of great people on the team. You know, Sarah Sarah's one of them, and you know we have her experience to learn from. And uh, you know, we try to try to maximize all the talent and ability that we have on the team from from all our employees, not just our ownership. So we're definitely blessed with a good group. Joseph Newgarden, driver of the number 67 car, is your teammate over at CFH Racing. He's got two wins on the season. So what is that information like between the 67 and your 20 car? Uh, I mean, everything's, everything's very open. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's one thing, you know, a big part of the reason why we, why we merged my team and Sarah's team together was to, to have strength in numbers. So to do that, you know, you have to, you have to be open and committed to working with one another and, um, you know, being selfless, you know, for the, for the greater good of the team. So, uh, Joseph's a great kid, great driver, uh, and and really, really a good person, and and that's really made our relationship that much smoother. With uh, all the talk that came out after the Auto Club Speedway race there a couple weeks ago, you got any thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, there is certainly a lot of opinions flying around. You know, I thought it was a thought it was a very exciting race. I had fun while I was out there, and um, you know, every, other people had different opinions, and. They're allowed to have those, but you know, I thought some some of it, some of the knee-jerk reaction, you know, right after the race is over, you got to think about what you're saying a little bit. But <laughs> at the same time, I've been guilty of it. We all have been at some point, so you just got to learn from it and, and move on. But at the end of the day, I thought it was a great race. The fans that were there loved it, and everyone that watched on TV loved it. So you got to you got to balance all that out. Well, absolutely. Talking along that same line, have you ever stuck the nose in a spot where you didn't think you should and said, oops, kind of scared yourself a little bit? Uh, I don't know that I've scared myself a little bit, but, you know, certainly, you know, I've been doing this for for a long time. So you definitely definitely make moves that you wish you could take back as soon as you make them here and there. Um, You know, as you get older and more experienced, I think you get better at managing your emotions and and not making those mistakes. It's certainly easier when you're younger and trying to make a big impression on everyone. Um, but you know, you try to, you try to avoid those, that type of behavior. 
the, going back to the Auto Club Speedway uh, race, that pack style racing, is there a track you have pin- pinpointed on your calendar in the next couple of months or rest of the season, really, that you say, oh, we might see that pack racing back there. Maybe IndyCar needs to take a look at the rules package. Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, you know, I, and I don't even I, I don't even feel comfortable calling Fontana a pack race. You know, it's as close as we've been to pack racing in a while. But, you know, at the same time, the pack race to me is when everyone's flat out and it's super easy. And Fontana Fontana is a difficult track. Everyone's lifting and, and using all the track. There's five lanes. You know, it, it, that's probably a little too close to pack racing for, for a lot of people. But um, the the remaining ovals we have left, you know, Iowa's a, it's a short track and it's going to be tight racing, but you can't, you're never going to call short track racing, pack racing, it's mm-hmm. short track racing. And Pocono, you know, has the tendency to race more like Indianapolis, you know, a little more spread out just from the, the variation in the corners. But, um, you know, I don't think there's anywhere that we're going the rest of the year that that's any cause for concern, even for the guys that are worried about that type of racing. What's more nerve-wracking for you, driving the leading car for the last five laps or being the owner watching someone else drive the leading car for the last five laps? Uh, I think it's definitely more stressful watching from the timing stand just yeah. because you don't you don't have any you don't have any control over what's going to happen out there. You know, when you when you're in the car, you're so focused on the moment and you know focused on each corner and hitting your marks um, that you don't really you know you have the stress, but you know you're also enjoying it and having fun. Uh, on the timing stand, you're just thinking about every scenario and everything that could go wrong. When you're in the car, you're just so focused on driving that you don't have all those other thoughts going through your head. We're talking with Ed Carpenter, number, the number the driver of the number 20 CFH Racing uh, Verizon IndyCar Series. We've talked a lot about Ed the driver, so let's talk about Ed Carpenter, the the everyday citizen. What's, what, what's something fun you like to do to kind of relax after a, a stressful time at the racetrack? Uh, I'm a pretty, pretty low-key guy, so... You know, it, with with the with the racing schedule and and the race team, and focusing on that, you know, it takes a lot of time. And then I've got a, a great family at home, three three young kids, all under seven. So, you know, when when I get the chance to get away from here and and not be working, you know, we try to just have fun as a family and uh, you know do do things together. So. Nothing too flashy. Well, we all know this is a family thing. A lot of uh, third and fourth generation racers. So is is that kind of the path that your children are going down? Are you starting to see that driver bug in their eye that they want to maybe take after dad? Uh, our rider, my middle son, he's definitely interested and in, and loves loves the sport. Um, haven't got him started yet. Uh, we're trying to introduce him to everything and. You know, if he still wants to give racing a shot here when he gets a little older, we'll we'll talk about it then. But I'm definitely not just going to start him out at, at six years old. You've one of your main sponsors is Fud, Fuzzy's Vodka. Were you a vodka drinker before this, or was that something that you picked up since you got such a great sponsor? Uh, I definitely drink a little more vodka now than what <laughs> what I did before. But um, you know, I've I've always I've always had a little bit of an appetite for. For, for a good drink, so it's a it's a good partnership we have with Fuzzies. you got to be careful with the words you choose there so you don't come <laughs> off like an alcoholic, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm, oh, I, mean, I drank my fair share before, and I drink my fair share now. <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I, went, I graduated from college, so. We all uh, went there. We, we've all, that's know. kind of a, a hard pass when you're college life. <laughs> exactly. You know, I definitely wasn't drinking anything as good as Fuzzies in college, I can tell you that much. Hey, there you go. You didn't have the budget for Fuzzies, huh? Did not. They, but go. that's that's got to be fun though, especially with this sport, because you get to have sponsors that then you get to go and do cool things outside of the racetrack with them. They they're a great partner. Um, you know, fu- first of all, Fuzzy Zeller, whose name's on the bottle, he he's a, a great guy, a ton of fun. You know, he's he's been a great ambassador for golf, and and you know he's really enjoying the IndyCar series and and has a lot of fun with it, and and is turning into a great ambassador for IndyCar. So. Um, you know, we've had a great partnership. You know, we, we first started together in 2010, and it's been going really well. What was the first lesson you learned when racing the Indianapolis 500? Um, you know, I think the biggest thing for me is just just that I was taught early and still focus on is just the amount of respect you have to have for the track. You know, and I think that's the case whether it's in an Indy car, Indy Lights car, or a stock car. Um, they, you know, the speeds are so high there, and there's such a small margin of error. 
um, that that you really just have to respect respect the pay, place each and every lap, each and every corner, and you know whoever can can do that the most and keep their focus is going to be successful. Speaking about respect in a place like a racetrack, do you have any superstitions? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not a superstitious guy at all. I think that is just a stock car thing. Is uh, it? Well, when we talked to Marco, he said the same thing. Yeah. You get around these. Uh, we're out here with the dirt track guys every week, and and we get to Iowa and Kansas. And I was a NASCAR official for eighteen years, so I know some of those guys. But these guys are superstitious. I mean, you've got uh, they uh, won't eat peanuts, won't eat chicken. Some of the dirt- uh, there, there, there's guys like that here, but I don't, I don't know. Just I don't see how. What color car you drive or peanuts, can it, how it can possibly have an effect on the outcome of, so of there, a race. There are a few superstitious drivers in the IndyCar series, just not a lot? Oh, yeah. I, okay. th- I, don't, I think it's just a society thing. We've been talking with Ed Carpenter, driver and owner of the number 20 CFH racing car in the Verizon IndyCar series. You can catch the Verizon IndyCar series today at Mid-Ohio on CNBC at 1 p.m. Ed, best of luck today, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. And we will return here on the front stretch in turn number three. We'll be back. This is the front stretch on AM 590, Omaha's ESPN Radio. Are you looking to book your next outing? Look no further than Joe's Carding in Council Bluffs. Located just north of Bass Pro Shop, Joe's Carding can handle outings of well over 100 plus people. Bachelor parties, corporate outings, team building, birthday parties, and much more. Give Buddy a call today and reserve your outing. Joe's will even work with local restaurants to cater your event. Book yours today at joescarding.com. That's Carding with a K. It's time to get to Joe's and find out what everyone already knows. If you love wings, rings and all kinds of other tempting things great times great food get to quaker steak and lube quaker steak and lube is the official watering hole for the front stretch and the best place to catch all the nascar action today open at 11 a.m with delivery available to council bluffs great times great food get to quaker steak and lube feather the brake and get back to the gas Dan and Dirk are headed into turn three on the front stretch. Welcome back to the front stretch, heading into turn number three. And uh, a couple of new sponsors we're bringing on board, Dirk. Things are starting to heat up around here on the front stretch. want to say welcome to Tuffy's Auto Service in Bellevue. Uh, I'm the kind of guy I like to fix things on my own, but then I'm also the kind of guy that likes to uh, pay other people to fix the things that I break. Uh, so a couple of times already I've had to go to Jim over at Tuffy's and, and have him fix my stuff. So uh, welcome on board to, to Tuffy's. Next weekend we're going to get kicked off with uh, Kansas Speedway. The uh, We're just around the corner, guys, for the chase starting in the October race. I booked our hotel rooms this week for uh, the uh, October, what is that, uh, 18th and 19th down yeah, at Kansas. something like that, yeah. So uh, getting all that stuff lined up, it's it's busy. And joining us in the studio now, Chad Robb, uh, Mr. Fantasy. You can find him on Facebook. NASCAR tips from Chad uh, and uh, get all sorts of great information. Not just NASCAR, but also uh, all sorts of sports, baseball, basketball, and I think you do football also. Football, yeah. Yep. We're going to be doing some uh, daily fancy football picks this year. So. All right. Uh, appreciate you joining us, Chad. One of the things we're going to talk about in turn number three is uh, the Michael Waltrip Racing. And this could all just be conversation. Who knows if Michael Waltrip Racing is kind of posturing to maybe get a little bit more out of Toyota or if they're actually serious about moving over to Chevy. I kind of got to thinking about it, and, and I, I'm, I'm harping on the Fords and, and the Roushes because of the, the lack of... Well, anything really anything out of that division so what i did was i took the top 20 drivers in the in the standings as of uh, indianapolis as the results of indianapolis and of the 20 races that have been ran so far uh, 11 wins belong to chevy two wins belong to ford and seven wins belong to toyota now, obviously, when I say I talked, took the top 20 in standings, I included Kyle Busch because he's kind of in a... a, a he's going to be there. Yeah, he's in, a, he's in a weird circumstance right now. So I included him in that, too. Uh, of the entire field of cars now, Chevy owns 51% of the field with uh, their, I think uh, they have 22 cars that are running Chevys of the 43. Ford has 28% of the field and Toyota has 21%. Now, where I'm going with this is that 
Since Chevy owns 51% of the field, you would assume they would own around 50% of the wins, top fives, and top tens. And that's about where they at. they're at. 55% of the wins so far right now are under the Chevy banner. And 62% of the top fives are under the banner. Now, Ford, I'm going to continue to hop on these guys. They have about 30% of the field, but only 10% of the wins, 18% of the top fives, and 15% of the top tens. They're not even showing up in their fair share of the top tens. Better yet, top fives and wins. So as Ford, I know we're talking about Michael Waltrip Racing and and furniture row switching, but as Ford, you got to really kind of start worrying about people bailing on your organization. I mean, I don't think the power's an issue for those guys. It's just, you know, like this week, it was, you know, the new handling package, that big mm -hmm. spoiler and everything on it. You know, some guys adapt to that. Kyle Busch showed he could adapt to it at Kentucky when they took the spoilers off the cars. He went out and blew everybody away. Now they... Put a big one on there, and he still went out and beat everybody. <laughs> if you were Roush Fenway Racing, would you consider switching organizations, switching manufacturers? I mean, it's... Roush has been with Ford since back, I think, in the 60s. Yeah. So it would take a whole bunch of money for Ford to let him go. Not to mention, I believe, doesn't doesn't Ford, uh, uh, Roush manufacture the Ford engines? Much like Hendrick manufactures right. many of the Chevy engines. Yeah. So that would be a big revenue loss for, for Roush if, if they did that, too. Maybe that's one of the reasons why they're sticking there. Toyota's not doing too bad. They've got 21% of the field while they uh, of the cars in the field, and they have 35% of the wins, 19% of the top fives, and 19% of the top tens. Obviously, Kyle Busch is, is holding that camp down. He has 20% of the entire wins so far this year. On that 18 car alone. So uh, Toyota's kind of in that, that bargaining position where they could say, uh, Martin Truex Jr., who you've got one win, uh, but uh, not much after that. You've only got six top fives and 15 top tens. Come on over here to Toyota and we'll give you that attention. Have you ever seen that conversation, Dirk, that's going on between teams and, and manufacturers about switching camps? I've never seen the conversation. I've heard it secondhand back in the truck series from truck owners. You know, and, uh, and, you know, when they were getting wined and dined and it literally just comes down to the money. And I mean, it's got to be for them to change. It has to be substantial because they got to swap out everything they already have. You want to talk about you know, costing yourself some money. Yeah, exactly. So the, the switch, uh, as far as the dollars that are going to get thrown at them has to be huge or they're not going to do it. Yeah. And this would be a good conversation, I guess, to have with Tom Ackerman because he kind of just went through this where uh, Toyota kind of wind him, or excuse me, uh, uh, he switched from Brad Keselowski to 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 uh, KB to KBM to Kyle Busch Motorsports. So yeah, Toyota just wind and just kind of got him to come over to the Kyle Busch camp, and he said one of the big reasons was because of the technical support. He said it's it's like a hornet's nest when you're around a Toyota truck versus. It's 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 like you got the plague when you're around a Ford truck. The the Ford Toyota Chevy engineers truck. are all over those things. Chevy just used to have one engineer. Ford used to have one engineer. Dodge always had a couple, mm -hmm. and uh, Toyota come in with I don't know how many. Just, just like I said, a swarm of them. But I really doubt it was Toyota that got involved with Tom's deal. Yeah, you're probably right. But uh, it, it'd be interesting to talk to him and see if if maybe he had any conversations and what all that entailed of of please come over here and you know because sometimes the manufacturers will get involved probably not on the on the engineer level but maybe on the engineer level but sometimes they get involved on the crew chief and and usually and sometimes they even get involved in the driver level. Oh, absolutely on the driver and the crew chief. But I, I doubt very much on the engineer. Now they probably talked to Tom. When uh, I'm sure Rick Wren, who is general manager at KBM, brought him over, mm -hmm. and uh, there was probably some Toyota people there, and uh, you know they talked about things, but uh, I don't think Toyota actively recruited him. I I'd be surprised if they did. Let's put it that way. Well, he's doing well over there so far. Uh, but uh, those are just—it's kind of just some numbers I was crunching earlier this week, looking at at the landscape. But uh, if if I was Michael Waltrip Racing, would I really be considering leaving Toyota for? Uh, quite frankly, what seems to be a, a packed Chevrolet field. So, st guys, help me out here with this. Dirk, maybe you can help me out again. Is it better for Michael Waltrip Racing to stick with the Toyota and, and the dedicated team they have or maybe go over with Chevy and be able to get more technical alliances with some more teams? Well, they'd get them with the teams, but they wouldn't get the support that Toyota's bringing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, right now Toyota would be the team to be with. And I'd be surprised if Michael Waltrip's actually trying to court Chevrolet as much as Toyota's telling him goodbye. Really? Well, look at their performance this year. Yeah. 
That team has been ab- an absolute disaster. Well, it's it's been like that since. I mean, it was the whole debacle at Darlington a couple of what was that two years ago? Yeah, it was at Richmond. Uh, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, but it's it's yeah. They, they look to be the next hot team. And I think this is probably just me. Again, I think we already established in turn one how crazy I am. But I think it has a lot to do with Rodney Childers. With him leaving that organization and coming over to Stuart Haas Racing, that was a huge impact he made immediately on that four team and took him to, the, took him to a championship. Michael Waltrip Racing all of a sudden did a complete 180 and just went downhill from there. But yeah, it's... Um, I, I hadn't thought about that Toyota aspect of maybe they're they're going to pull their support and move it over to an, and try to get some other team come over there. Well, and not necessarily pull it completely, but at least cut it. Mm-hmm. You know, especially if they're actively pursuing front row motorsports and they're going to bring two more teams on, they're going to say, well, Michael, half your funding's gone because we're going to fund this front row motorsports mm-hmm. two teams. You know, and I mean, that could very well be what's happening. Absolutely. Something to think about. All right, let's take a quick break. We'll come back in turn number uh, four. Boy, show's already almost over. We'll come back in turn number four, and we will talk with uh, Mr. Fantasy about some tips for your next six picks to make sure you're online for getting in your drivers for the uh, Pick'em's Contest and, uh, well, any other contest that you want to get involved with for Fantasy Leagues. We'll be back here on the Front Stretch. One of the hardest things to find in the world is a trusted mechanic. Your car breaks down. You need someone that won't see you as an opportunity to pad their wallet. Jim at Tuffy Tire and Auto Service in Bellevue is that person. From brake and AC inspections to custom exhaust and new tires, Tuffy Tire and Auto Service in Bellevue is your new trusted source for getting your car back on the road. Find them on Facebook at Tuffy Tire and Auto Service Center of Bellevue and online at TuffyBellevue.com. We have all been there before. Broken car part in your hand and some snot-nosed punk behind the counter has no idea what he is talking about, but he guarantees that this part will fix your car. You pay an arm and a leg for the replacement, get it home, and sure enough, it doesn't fit your car. Now, learn from your mistake and give an experienced salesperson at Kosiski Auto Parts a call today at 402-731-4592. Kosiski Auto Parts will get you back on the road with your arms and legs still attached. Joe's Karting in Council Bluffs has taken a page out of IMCA's rulebook and gone crate. These brand new low emission engines will still have you white knuckling it all through the Metro's fastest indoor facility. Joe's Karting is now friendly for all skill levels with their brand new Honda powered engines. It's time to get to Joe's today and find out what drivers like Jack Dover, Shaylee Bate, and Andrew Kosiski have known for years. Located in Council Bluffs and online at joeskarting.com. That's karting with a K. It's checkers or wreckers as we enter turn four on the front stretch. Presented by Joe's Carding and Council Bluffs. Just about ready to wrap this baby up. Heading into turn number four. Brought to you by Quaker Steak and Lube and Council Bluffs. All the action for today's race at Pocono on the big screens at Quaker Steak and Lube. Uh, Coverage starts at uh, 1130 on NBC and MRN with the green flag at about 1230. So make sure you're... Uh, in front of your TV or at Quaker Steak and Lube. By the way, earlier this week on Wednesday was National Wing Day, so they held a big atomic wing contest at Quaker Steak and Lube. That's the kind of fun stuff you could see at the Lube in Council Bluffs. Bike nights, classic car nights, kids nights on Monday nights. Uh, it's a lot of fun down there. Qu- see Quaker people steak. burn their innards. Oh, I, I'm, I, 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 one of these days I'm going to do it. When you have to sign a piece of paper <laughs> and wear plastic gloves so you don't burn your hands, I ain't, I got no idea what that's going to do to your throat. I know. And, I, I, I'm the idiot that whenever I make jalapeno poppers and I cut up the jalapenos and then touch my eye and, oh, yeah, that capsaicin gets in that feels great. All right, back to NASCAR and racing and, and talking about relevant stuff. Uh, Mr. Fantasy Chad Rob joins us uh, in the studio today. Appreciate you coming back on the show, bud. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. Six races to go before the chase is locked and loaded. Do you see any driver? out there uh, getting wins that don't have them yet? I think there might be two. Yeah? yeah I, I, everybody's on the A.J. Allmendinger bandwagon for uh, Watkins, Watkins Glen. Uh, I tell you, though, I think I'm on the Kyle Busch bandwagon. This guy might be getting six or seven wins by the time the chase starts. I don't know. Do you... I know he's been running up front. He's been running great, but he's had a lot of stuff go right for him. Yeah. You know, to get all these wins. There's been years in past that Kyle has just not had luck on his side, and weird things happened. 
I mean, he was one of the hot drivers going into the chase last year and was eliminated after round two because he wrecked at Kansas on, what, lap three or four? Yeah, it wasn't very long. And wrecked at Talladega, and I think he had a bad race at Charlotte. and Or no, he wrecked at Charlotte, and then he missed the the cut by just a couple of points at Talladega. It was it was heartbreaking to see that. So it's, it's good to see. It. But anyways, uh, so do you think AJ's going to get it done at Watkins Glen? I'd love to see it happen. I don't yeah. know if it's going to happen. I mean, there's a lot of drivers that are pretty good out there. Brad Kozlowski's really good out there. He stinks out at Sonoma. He I does. Don't, it's, it, it don't make any sense. They were talking about um, – Sonoma is more of a finesse track, and Watkins Glen is more of an aggressive track, which yeah. just fits Keselowski's style. Yeah. And and you're right, he he was he's terrible at Sonoma, but yeah. you would think road courses would be the same. But they're, I guess just the way that they're set up, they're they're two totally different animals. So you've got uh, possibly AJ Allmendinger moving on. Anybody else moving on? I think Casey Kane's going to get in there. I really? know everybody's been overlooking him, but every year he waits till last minute before he gets in the chase. Yeah. And, uh, I got him marked down for Bristol. Okay. And that's one of his best tracks. He's got one of the best driver ratings there, one of the best average finishes. And I think uh, Hendricks is going to give him the best car they got and tell him, go get it done. And... Uh, I think he might find his way to victory lane. Who's getting in on points? On points. Let's see. I got uh, three guys getting in on points. I got 13 winners this hmm. year with uh, Jamie McMurray, Jeff Gordon, and Ryan Newman getting in on points. I And to think about Newman, if he wouldn't have lost 50 points for the suspension earlier in the season, he'd yeah. be sitting really good right yeah, now. Yeah, he would. He would. I've got Gordon getting in on points also, but I, that was a tough one for me. And he just We just talked about Kyle Busch having a lot of luck. I think he's taking all of Jeff Gordon's luck. Gordon is just having just a horrible time this year with cars and being in the wrong place at the wrong time and, frankly, just terrible setups. Uh, Dirk, who do you have getting in? I've got Newman, Kane, and McMurray okay. getting in, and I'm going out on a limb, and obviously I put Kyle Busch in there. Yeah, I think we're um, <laughs> But I think Gordon's going to get a win yet, and you'll be happy to know I think Stewart's going to get a win. Really? That does make me happy. <laughs> Thank you, Dirk. Wow. Brighten my Sunday up. <laughs> Brighten up your man crush. Put a big <laughs> rainbow on it for you. I've got three of them now. Scott, Scott, uh, Scott Bloomquist, uh, Steve Letarte, oh. and Tony Stewart. Bloomquist is still the main man. Oh, yeah. Us. No one's getting, yeah. I, I, Letarte's still out. He's on a fence there. <laughs> All right, round number two. So we've got... We've got I've got Kane, Boyer, Newman, McMurray, and Gordon getting into the chase for round number one for Chicago, Lane, New Hampshire, and Dover. Kind of briefly, guys, who uh, Chad, who do you have getting eliminated in round number one? Who isn't moving on for you? Who isn't moving on? Let's see. I got McMurray not moving on, Almondinger, uh, he's not moving on, and Kane. Okay, Dirk, who do you have getting eliminated? I've got Kane, Newman. And who else did I have? Denny Hamlin. I had uh, I have Kane, Boyer, Mc, uh, Gordon, and Edwards getting eliminated in round number one. Moving on to round number two, Kansas, Charlotte, and Talladega. This is the one that could really spell torture for Kyle Busch. Chad, who do you have getting eliminated? I got Kyle Busch moving on. I got uh, Earnhardt winning at Talladega. I got Jimmy Johnson with the win in Harvick. Okay. The guys I got left out, I got Gordon, it looks like. Truex is out. Carl Edwards is out. And uh, Matt Kenseth out. That's I've, I've got Kenseth, Kozlowski, McMurray, and Newman all making their way out of the chase after that. It, it starts to get to the point that, that round two is when you can't get by on points anymore. you really got to start racking up those wins. Moving out of round number two, Dirk, who do you have getting eliminated? I've got Junior going out, both Penske cars. And uh, Stewart. Moving on to round number three. That's your final, uh, your eliminator round, Martinsville, Texas, and Phoenix. So we're going to flip the script. Who's moving on to Homestead to battle for the championship? Uh, Chad? I got Kevin Harvick with a simple win at Phoenix. I got yeah. jo <laughs> Joey, Joey Logano winning. I got Jimmy Johnson with the win. And then Kyle Busch making it in on points. Yeah. Uh, Dirk, who do you have? I've got two teams taking it to the finish line. I got Kyle Busch and Edwards making it, and Kurt Busch and Harvick. Hmm. So it's going to be a Stuart Haas Racing versus Joe Gibbs. I've got Logano, Kyle Busch, Johnson, and Harvick. My championship winner. I've got I've got Kyle Busch. 
I, I got Harvick. Do you? In, in order to Back be the to man, back? you got to beat the man. That's true. That's absolutely true. Dirk, who do you have for your champion? I went ahead and took KB. I think he's on a roll, and I think it stays that way. But, absolutely. But my question is, has he peaked too soon? That, and that's what I'm afraid of, is that he's peaking right now, and you know he's going to fade down the stretch. I think the tale will be, what does he do when he officially qualifies for the chase? I mean, it could be as soon as today with Pocono. He's got 23, Three. 23, 23 points to pick up. He's been picking up points into the 30s last couple of races. Today could be the day that he qualifies for the chase. So the real question would be, how does he handle the last four or five races when he's into the chase? Does he conserve or does he keep driving like we've seen Kyle Busch drive all year so far in, in the races he's been in? I, I don't think I I've ever seen Kyle Busch hold back anything. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's not in his vocabulary. Is yeah. to take it easy, especially right. his tongue. Yeah, uh, Pocono for today. Who do you have for your winner, Chad? I got Harvick. He's got to turn these uh, second place finishes into a win sometime. Uh, let's see your five drivers with the best average finish for Pocono uh, the last two years: Dale Jr., Kurt Busch, Kyle Larson, Jeff Gordon, and Kevin Harvick. Your sleeper pick for today is Jamie McMurray. So uh, that's how the uh, the picks lay out. If uh, you are a part of the Pickums contest, make sure your picks are in before the green flag waves. And uh, Midwest Fall Brawl Pickums contest. Again, we appreciate everybody over at I-80 Speedway for giving us those tickets. Uh, it's hot and heavy right now uh, as uh, there are four people who have wins already this uh, for the first contest and 47 points to lead out the uh, Fall Brawl contest. So uh, if you want to get involved in any of those contests, email us, frontstretch590 at gmail.com. Any tips from Chad? You can find them online at NASCAR Tips from Chad at uh, Facebook. So Facebook.com slash NASCAR Tips from Chad. I got that right, right? Yes. All right. Dirk, always do appreciate it, buddy. You're welcome. It's good to see you again. We'll be back next weekend to recap Pocono, talk to Shaylee Bade. Who knows what other interviews we're going to scare up. And we will preview Michigan. This is the front stretch. It's been presented by Joe Scarting on AM590, Omaha's ESPN Radio. If you love wings, if you love rings, and all kinds of other tempting things. Great times, great food, get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Quaker Steak and Lube is the official watering hole for the front stretch and the best place to catch all the NASCAR action today. Open at 11 a.m. with delivery available to Council Bluffs. Great times, great food, get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Are you looking to book your next outing? Look no further than Joe's Carding in Council Bluffs. Located just north of Bass Pro Shop, Joe's Carding can handle outings of well over 100 plus people. Bachelor parties, corporate outings, team building, birthday parties, and much more. Give Buddy a call today and reserve your outing. Joe's will even work with local restaurants to cater your event. Book yours today at joescarding.com. That's Carding with a K. It's time to get to Joe's and find out what everyone already knows.